Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. Uh, happy Easter everybody, I hope you all had a great, um, well I don't know if any of you were on spring break or on <laughs> Easter break or on uh, break from work or anything like that. I am, uh, and so I get a chance to have some time off. I took some time away from the channel too and just kind of relax. But I wanted to get back to it with a video on eight adventures for you guys to add into your games. Now these are eight old school adventures. They're very short. Uh, this is the shortest, the first. I'm gonna be doing shortest to longest in this video. The first one's only one page, but they're a good mix of oh, it's, uh, old school essentials, Shadow Dark, Cairn, System Neutral. Some of them are pay what you want. A couple of them are, you know, actually uh, have, a, have a price tag on them, but they're not very high. And they're all really, really interesting. I like them all for different reasons. And I wanted to, you know, just go through and, and give you guys a sense, again, of what's out there in, in these things. So uh, the first one is The Hidden Gods of the Woods. This is it. It's a one-page adventure. I love it. So this design is Felipe Tuller uh, with Victor Barras and Mink the Ent, I think, are the three designers here. And it's great. Really, really great. I love every element of this. The fact that, first of all, it's one page. That's fantastic. I love the... Uh, design of the dungeon itself. It's looped well, it's uh, interesting, it's, it's got lots of choices for the players and meaningful choices. The isometric map is a delight. And the layout of the room descriptions is awesome. Now this is system neutral, so there's gonna be a lot of work to be done, or not a lot of work, but some work to be done if you wanted to make this um, playable, runnable. And also the tone is, is very specific. It's kind of body horror, it's kind of cosmic horror. You've got you know, aliens in the basement or in the caves below the house, basically and uh, the, the family's gone missing, or definitely definitely dead, most likely the hunter and his, uh, and his uh, clan, or at least the hunter. I don't know if he had a clan, it doesn't really specify. A lot of it's left to your imagination and to your creativity as a, as a GM. But there's a lot of great, uh, I would say, beginning, uh, or, or like hints at what you would add in as you go through. You know, for example, if you look at, say, the experiment room, uh, creatures with needle-shaped tools inject strange liquids into humans. Cages with ordinary humans and hybrids, half aliens. Alien components can be studied to create new spells or used to enhance spellcasting. But that's it. That's the only thing you get for the experiment room, so you're going to have to come up with the details there. But it's a great beginning. And again, the layout is awesome. The final creature, the Slibnak, the queen of the green planet, is a great villain boss thing. Uh, basically a beholder, and that's kind of the idea. Is I think the, the, the monsters are kind of beholder-ish. They have tentacles that squirt acids, or at least they have tentacles that do things. They have eyes, uh, eye monsters. Um, whether they have one eye or many eyes, that's up to you, but it looks like they at least have one big central eye. So, you know, there's a lot going on here. Um, eye motifs throughout, stuff like that. I think it's cool. I really do. And again, this is uh, pay what you want. This is on uh, itch.io. Itch I'll put a link below to where you can get it. But a fantastic little one-page dungeon. I love these things. I don't think we can have too many of them. The next one I wanted to cover is The Lonesome Keep. And this is just a little pamphlet. Uh, this is Pay What You Want on Drive-Thru RPG. And it's really cool. It's totally system neutral. It's totally, like, I would say again, I used this word before, generic, but in the best possible sense. It's an adventure location for old-school-styled role-playing games by Benjamin Levesque. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, this is an awesome little uh, pamphlet. This is it. The concept, information about the keep, and essentially it's a detailed, realistic keep. Now, that's not a huge deal, but I mean, it's not something that you couldn't do on your own, but it's pay what you want, and it is really cool. It's just laid out really, really well. And again, with that realism that I like in my old school games, I think this is fantastic. With possible keep inhabitants and rumors about the keep, you know, this is what I could ask for from a pay what you want or free product, right? It's just like, hey, a few pages of a basic description, but it's laid out realistically. I'm sure you guys have seen those towers that people have created online maps where, like, it doesn't make any sense. You're like, okay, there's a three-room tower and you have, like, 15 monsters in here or 15 enemies in here and there's a dungeon, a wizard's lab laboratory, and an observatory, right? It's like, well, where are they eating? Where are they living? How does that lay? So this is a realistic Norman-style keep of the 12th century. So if that's the style of game that you're interested in, this is a great little layout. And I learned something when I was reading through this. Like, it's, it's not intended to be like an informational pamphlet or anything like that, but I did. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. I didn't know that that's how that worked. And that makes sense that that worked that way. So things like that. 
Um, it's a fantastic little document. I'd recommend you guys check it out. And just, you know, if you're gonna have some keeps, some towers in your world, and, and that's the thing, so it's a central keep, but it says it's sort of assumed that you would have a bit of a wall around this with outlying buildings. But if you don't wanna do that, you can make it a tower. So I, either way, it's super cool. I like things like this. I like, one of my favorite books as a kid was Castle. Uh, I don't know if you guys know that. It's this big, big pamphlet book. Um, I loved that book. And there was a BBC, uh, I don't know, like episode. It was like an hour about it. <laughs> and it was just, uh, it was just awesome. I remember watching that all the time as a kid. Uh, we had it on VHS. And this reminds me of that. Just the way it's laid out, the way it's described. Awesome. So highly recommend The Lonesome Keep. Just as a little bite that you can put into your world. Uh, if you need a tower that is realistic and well laid out. I highly recommend this one. The third that I'm going to cover is Downsized Dungeons, Issue 3. This is four pages. This is the Ziggurat of the Lizard People. So this is for Old School Essentials. The first two were System Neutral. This is for Old School Essentials. Now, I really liked the first Downsized Dungeon. I had my quibbles about the second. The third one is my favorite. It's really, really good. It's a specifically... It's, it's tonally specific. The map makes sense with the tone. The layout, the, the encounters, the stuff you're... It just, it all, it all is cohesive in a way that the second one wasn't. Um, but then I thought the first one was also, the first one was good. It was just kind of, you know, a, a barrow in the mountains. This is a ziggurat with sacrifice and lizard cultists and all that stuff. And, and it's what you would hope, you know, it's what you'd hope from that sort of thing. Great piece of art for the old, for the uh, ziggurat as a whole, with then the uh, stat blocks, treasure, and the items that you can find here, the Flamberg dagger. And then the map itself. I really like this map. It's super cool. Give it to your players, uh, and they're going to have a good time. Especially if you did something like a use, you, know, you take this out and put it on a, um, a VTT. I think it'd be kind of cool to explore this. You know, it's 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 very simple, but it loops very nicely. And if you're coming here to stop a sacrifice, you don't want a massive dungeon. It makes sense that they're going to be having like a sacrifice going on. And the players would have to arrive to stop it. I like that kind of pulpy feeling. I like that. So that's what we have here. Lizard cultists. And then some optional features if you want to add them. By the way, I went back to the stat blocks. I think that's cool. You can give them zealotry or anointed in blood. Make them stronger if you'd like with the total treasure that you can get from this place. I think this is a, a great short, you know, again, burst of adventure put into your world. The ziggurat of the lizard people. So my favorite of the three. The writing in this one is also, I think, the best just in terms of the tone that it gives you. I like it a lot. Now, again, a lot of the value of this dungeon is the map itself and the, uh, the uh, creatures and the, the items, the treasure you get. The first, three, first two pages have a little bit of that overriding, but not, it's not unwelcome here. Because, again, I think that the, the connection between the tone and what's being described and then the map itself, all that works in a way that the second one didn't. Remember, the second one was just kind of like a mine and nothing in the dungeon made the horror idea necessary or the background of the idea necessary. Like it was just, it was tacked on in a way that didn't feel like it was, you know, you know, cohesive. This one, it all makes sense. It's a temple and therefore the background makes sense with what's currently going on there and with what you can run into and with the map itself and everything. So highly recommend Ziggurat of the Blizzard People. Again, I'll put links below to where you can get it. This one's also pay what you want. The fourth uh, one that I wanted to cover is Barrow of the Raging Storm. This is for Shadow Dark. This is only four pages as well, so it's very short, but it's awesome. This is another great little adventure. It's got a great central idea. I like the art and the map. It's really cool. <laughs> Written and illustrated by Gabriel Hernandez. Fantastic. I love this. And, and one of the things about this dungeon that's interesting, as you can see, is that it does have a kind of central path. One, two, three, five, six. But there are secret, and the, with the optional door to four, but there are secret doors in two and in six that provide a bit of a loop option if the players find it. So there is choice if the players are hunting and sneaking and looking around. Um, I might even just make the, door, the secret door in room two open. So, or like, so that, that that way they know they can loop it. And then maybe the secret door out of six is, is something they have to find. Because I like having that, that option be open to them the choices and, and the ways that they can go. So, you know, if the players do find it, that's great. But I like the dungeon layout. I love the way it's drawn. It's fantastic. The The color palette reminds me, and not the art style, but the color palette reminds me of like Frog and Toad, if you guys ever read those books. 
when you were a kid. I don't know why, something about this, just that that's the impression I got when I looked at this map. But obviously the art does not look like that. A, break, a brief breakdown of the whole dungeon, and this is it, this is the whole dungeon. Essentially you have a, a necromancer who is trying to create a flesh golem, and she has hired these pirates to return with uh, basically to raid ships or to attack ships on the way back from raiding and to they can keep the treasure but she wants the bodies so it's kind of a creepy you know uh idea going on here and the tomb itself is been blessed by thor because the person who was originally buried here was blessed by thor such that it's lightning strikes every day here which is why the neck is here because that lightning is what she's going to use to an or help her animate the, the flesh golem so there's a really cool reason. One of the things I first thought, I was like, well, why is, why, this one seems kind of coincidental, right? For them, <laughs> like for the players to be coming here while there's also this barrow in the first place and she's doing, why is she using this as her hideout? But it all makes sense and it comes together with that lightning storm because it strikes every day and that's what she's using to try to raise the thing. Now, one question I might have is um, why the players would continue to search through the place once they've dealt with what they're, dealing with unless they're kind of like thieving you know <laughs> kind of uh treasure hungry players and they might be but uh room eight for example which is the final room in the barrow it's it's untouched there's nothing really going on there um it hasn't been looted the players they i don't know it might be they might not just they might just not go in there <laughs> or at least they might not loot it if they're here to stop the necromancer or they've been hired by the vikings who are being attacked by these pirates to go and to go and stop it or whatever it might be. I'm not sure they'd necessarily go in there. I, I certainly think there would be players who would go in there <laughs> to try to get what's what might be in the tomb. Um, and there's no like, uh, there's no curse or anything that uh, that you can see from opening the, the tomb. There's nothing like that. Although the magic item you get is insanely good for Shadow Dark. It gives you fly for three rounds once per day, which is really strong, but you take double damage from blunt weapons, which is you know maybe a, a possible risk. So there's a little bit of a, makes it makes you like a bird, <laughs> the idea. You can speak Celestial, plus one AC, or more like an angel. But you have hollow bones. Right? So anyway, a great, this is a player map, which with, you know, what I really like about it, as you'll notice, is that uh, right around here, where the secret doors normally are, they've been removed. And it look, it's been kind of powered over. So if you were to use this as a VTT map, right, and you were to just like reveal up to the wall, the players wouldn't see the secret door. That's one of my problems with a lot of the player maps that I've seen elsewhere, which is that they'll just take the DM's map and they'll remove the numbers, but they won't do anything to hide secret doors. And so basically what you have to do is you kind of have to do this like, if you're doing a VTT map with a fog of war, you kind of have to do like a swath around it and players are like, hmm. And so you have to make it not even. And I just, I don't, yeah, I don't like doing that. So I really like this element and I wish more people would do that. Just remove the secret door and more than the secret door. So that way the, you can use it as a VTT and map and the players won't see it. I think that needs to start happening in our in our hobby. Uh, okay, the next tier is the Metery Mishap. This is a first to third level adventure designed for the use of Shadow Dark RPG. This is for uh, obviously Shadow Dark. This is by Sebastian Grabney of uh, Dawn Fist Games. Now I've reviewed uh, Adventurous, which was Sebastian's system that he designed, and with full disclosure, he sent me this uh, adventure and asked me to take a look at it. I really like it. I think it's a fantastic starting adventure. And this one, uh, I think it's. $2.95 or $3 on drive through RPG. This is nine pages. It's got great art by Carlos Castillo. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, so it makes sense that it would be, you know, you have to pay some money for it because the art is really good. <laughs> I really love that style of old school art. This is not a pay what you want or, or a free adventure. But what you get essentially is a very small region with a couple dungeons and some rumors and some hooks to maybe further adventures down the road. And it's laid out in that classic Shadow Dark style. Um, if you've read through Sebastian's other adventures based on the uh, the adventurous book, then you'll kind of get a sense of the tone that you're looking at here. It's not very, very grim dark. It's not very, very heavy. It's not terribly, terribly crazy whimsical or funny or anything like that. It's all it's, it's very, very good starting D&D uh, &D fantasy adventure. But the the adventure in this particular case, I think, is quite. It's quite well sweet to to be, to play a bit of a pun. Basically, there is a meadery that collects honey from these bees in a cave, and they stop producing, and so they need to go and figure out why. And of course, it turns out that they are giant bees 
which is awesome, but also that there are a bunch of gnolls that have set up in the cave and they're trying to smoke them out. Uh, there's also a horrible creature that is the kelp horror that has been killing fishermen nearby, and so the Fisherman's Guild wants someone to go investigate, and so that's a second dungeon that you can run into. Here's the brief map. Essentially, there is your starting location, two dungeons, and one crossing over the river, which has a bit of an encounter uh, with a spirit, a river spirit, which is kind of like a, a fey creature. It wants to tell riddles, and it wants to be um, entertained with magic and stuff. So it can be, it can be a, you know, mean if you are cruel to it or if you are not, if you don't play along with it. But if you do, then it's just a nice, more role-playing encounter and stuff like that. Um, now, one thing I would say uh, as you go through this adventure is that it's not going to be, like, super surprising. There's nothing about this adventure that's like, whoa. But it's a very, very solid starting location, and everything's laid out for you really well. There's a good timeline given to you. Um, and one of the things I love about this, especially for Shadow Dark and for designing Shadow Dark adventures, we need to start doing this. When the rewards are offered to you for the quests and things like that, they're given in terms of both their monetary value and their XP level. So... Tamilla Goldbrew offers a 300 gold piece reward, fabulous, to anyone that can solve their hunting issues. This is great because it, at a glance, tells the GM how many experience they're going to get if they do this. So it builds right into that sort of quest, the idea of quest experience. Now, some GMs are not going to like that. They're going to want to limit experience uh, from gold gain from those things that you got out of the dungeon, right? But I think if you're going to do a gold for experience and you have experience rewards for, you know, for, for being paid to do an adventure too, then it makes sense to connect it to the levels of experience. So I really like that. Fabulous. Uh, and you see that a couple times throughout where the monetary reward is laid out right beside the experience reward. So super cool. I really, really like that. You also have what's on the menu at the tavern, which I appreciate as well. There's the Seaweed Grotto. This is the first place, and it connects to Dawn Seeker Abbey, which is sort of a further adventure you could put in. It's not in this book, but it is uh, the the creature here used to be the nun or the, the abbess of that abbey, and uh, she was murdered by her, her, her nuns, and now she's wandered around the coast the past 200 years and has settled in this grotto, and she kills things. Uh, there are giant leeches in here. There's some... Um, there's a couple... Well, yeah, a couple of magic items leather armor and a magic ring which just gives plus one hit points it's a fabulous treasure so i'm not sure i would consider that a fabulous i think yeah it's probably a fabulous treasure plus one hit point yeah i don't know is that plus one hit point per level i might consider that normal honestly well maybe fabulous i don't know epic <laughs> it's something it, it's it's worth some experience points for sure to find it and uh the dungeons laid out very well very clearly, you can see where you're going to go. It's a little linear, like one, two, three, four. There's not really a loop. I mean, you have three as a side chamber if you want to go in there with some random encounters that you can roll. Uh, one of them is, uh, number three, is the random PC slips. I, I don't know about imposing those sorts of things on players, like you slip, uh, and then you make a check. Maybe I would uh, make it like, I might like, make that one like the floor of room three. Is, is slippery, and then the players know that. So instead of being like, hey, I'm gonna impose this. Now, it is a sea cave, and let me tell you, I have, I have gone through sea caves before, and I have slipped in them, and it is it does feel like it just hits you. So I guess in that respect, it, it makes sense. But I would, you know, in a game, I would probably make that more like, hey, this is something that can happen to you um, if you do this or do that. So rather than put it on the random encounter table, or, or maybe if you roll it on the random encounter, then tell them that the stretch of, you know, stone in front of them is slick or they notice that it's slick or give them a chance to spot that it's slick or something like that. That way they have more of a choice about how to approach it or get across it. A rope raft with the creature and then Honeywell Cave. Really great layout here. Now this is one bit I might say I wish it was on the next page too, the map. It's not a big deal, but given the shape of it actually, <laughs> if it were scaled down it would fit right down here on, you know, page 12. I think that'd be great if it were to scale down a little bit. I think you could. But anyway, that's one thing. But uh, otherwise, it's a great it's a great uh, dungeon. You can, if you have a way of speaking to animals, you can negotiate with the queen and the bees. I might provide a way to do that. It doesn't seem like there is any particular way to do that. Um, it just seems like if the players happen to have something that could do that, so maybe on the way that there's mushrooms that let them talk to animals, and maybe that's actually, now that I look at it, maybe 
No, there's mushrooms that let them heal, if you go back, but no mushrooms that let them talk to animals. I might add that in. That way, if they have a rumor in town about that, or they think they're putting that together, they have a way of negotiating. Otherwise, they're just probably going to be fighting both the bees, or <laughs> try not to fight the bees because they've been hired to, you know, preserve the source of honey, and try to fight those gnolls or get rid of them. And the gnolls also can be negotiated with, or it says very clearly that that's one way of, of resolving the adventure, is uh, to negotiate with the with the gnolls. So that's cool. You get uh, the bestiary in the back. And a thank you page. So this is a great adventure. Uh, a very, very solid, low-level starting off adventure. I love the art throughout. Um, highly recommend you guys check this one out on DriveThruRPG. The next adventure I'm going to be looking at is Dance of the Leprechaun. Now that, that sticker um, might be a suggested price, but it is pay what you want on DriveThruRPG. This is a one-shot scenario. Uh, fantastic adventure. I think this is hilarious. Uh, it's designed for St. Patrick's Day, <laughs> but you can play it any time of the year. It's about an evil leprechaun, or a leprechaun that you have to fight, and actually fight. Uh, and um, he's pretty dangerous. He's pretty dangerous. This is for old school essentials. You got a brief rundown of the adventure here with the overall map. Adventure secrets you can find out throughout the magic items that are here, and then some random leprechaun names if you need them. Whimsical and um, traditional. And then you've got the, you know, the... Uh, intro introduction which was Brett Brett Douglas sorry Brent Douglas Wisdom and Katie Wisdom put this together a bunch of play testers and uh, an introduction why this scenario and why a leprechaun fantastic great piece of art there of the leprechaun and then his stats as well as some information about him in old school essential terms and then the introduction the level gu gu guide the why why quest the duration and then the pacing which is interesting I hadn't seen this in Adventures before, this idea of general pacing tips, how long each section should take, and therefore how long you could expect this adventure to run. That's kind of cool. And I don't know if every table is going to need this or every table is going to want this, but I think it's really cool. I actually think that, especially if you've run something a few times as a GM in playtesting and you kind of get a sense of how long things take, that would be great. You know, great information. It would really help, especially if you're doing a one-shot to know how long this thing can take and what players, how long players or GMs should focus on each section. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, especially as this is a high level adventure. This is for like level 10, or uh, I guess it can be for level 10. This character's for fifth to eighth level, so you're probably not running this as an inexperienced GM. So, yeah. But I like it a lot. Great art there. I like that a lot. The magic items you find in this adventure, along with some, uh, you know, redone names. You get the hook and what's going on. The children were cruel or not cruel, maybe even just thoughtless. Yeah, maybe cruel. Anyway, bad stuff started to happen to him. You need to stop it. So it's a leprechaun's fault. You need to go and stop him. So go to the locale. And there's a guardian, a fairy that you can talk to, bribe, find a way through and get into the leprechaun's house with some secrets. The secrets are basically things you can find out as you go through the adventure. There are characters in the dungeon that if you negotiate with or roleplay with, they will tell you uh, more of these secrets. You get the entrance, dining room, kitchen, cellar, gallery, bedroom, and treasure room. I like the way that the back part is grayed out so you know what part you're looking at with some random encounters. And I like the way the random encounter tables are laid out so you get the encounter, the behavior, and the complication. I think you see this in Baron de Rop's videos. Uh, I don't know if he came up with this or if he just lays it out in those videos, but this is a, it's in that style, and it's how I do my random encounter tables too. An encounter, a behavior, and a complication. So you roll, uh, roll three times, and you get an interesting result. The, the example they give is a mimic eating cake and looking for gold. Now that would be really funny. I could definitely see that being a fun random encounter. The dungeon itself is pretty straightforward, and you're not really fighting a lot at first. You do start to fight stuff as you go through, Especially at the very end, you're going to fight. It seems to me a very hard fight. But you're not really fighting stuff throughout. You could, obviously, you could fight in these random encounters, especially. But it's not really the um, the focus. It's not a combat-heavy dungeon. It's more of a tricks and, you know, vibe dungeon. This is definitely a, you know, a St. Patrick's Day one-shot. You're drinking beer. You're playing a game. Yeah, I could see this being that sort of day. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, if you go back, I, I wanted to go back, is that there's just a straight-up death trap. Save versus die, and it's just dead. There's no, 
Nothing. It's a secret door and a death trap. So, you gotta be careful about that one. If it's a one-shot, it's not a huge deal. But maybe have a backup character just in case. And then you finally get to the uh, the back room, the Rock of Sham. This is where you talk to the... You finally meet the Leprechaun, and you're gonna fight him here. And uh, you're gonna have to fight him, because it's a tough fight. Every few rounds, he summons more creatures to help him in that fight. And then around six... Uh, or is it round six? Uh, round four, the illusion of a green dragon materializes, and the players will freak out. Yeah, but I think that's kind of cool. And then there are a couple of aftermaths, rules for what you do. And then the open gaming license with the back. This is Agronax Studios. This is a fantastic little one-shot adventure. Highly recommend the Dance of the Leprechaun. And again, I'll put links below to where you can get it. Uh, all right, the next I'm going to be looking at, these, next, these last two come from... The, uh, a Town of Forest and a Dungeon, the game jam uh, for Cairn. And they are really interesting. They're both really interesting. The first is Broken Circle, and it is 15 pages, the PDF, or 15 pages in spread, so 30 pages or so, right about. And essentially you have an adventure that's designed after African mythology, African f folklore, which is not something that we have a lot of touchstones for in most of our RPGs. Mostly it's, you know, Western medieval fantasy. Um, so it's really interesting to see a lot of the, a lot of those influences. Uh, this is by Eternal Torch, or uh, so I don't know who the actual writer is, but it's a, a fantastic, a fantastic adventure. I think it's really cool. It's a great use of public domain art, and then some, uh, some, yeah, it's, it's very, very flavorful. Now the the setting that it assumes is this very interesting world called the Crescent, where it's like a shattered. Not dystopic, but like post-apocalyptic world um, of deep ecological power, and so there are communities and nomads who travel around. And this is basically starting off in a jungle, but you could use it. At, uh, the, the introduction says you could use it in your own game and set it in a jungle region, and it would work just as well. There's a ziggurat. There are you know uh, spirits in the forest, zombies who are being protected, protecting the ziggurat, and uh, spirit walks and all this stuff. Uh, inspiration and uh, the mindset of going into it, the setting. And uh, the lion, which is a sort of key theme throughout. This is one of the dramatis persona of the art here. It's great. Great use of public domain art. I think this is public domain art. Really interesting to me. Gives you a sense of difference from a lot of what we see in a lot of these games. And I like how these uh, characters are laid out. The role, what they want, what they know, what they give, what they protect, and what the, their secret is. Really cool. Then you have nomad backgrounds. These are possible roles. So character creation, you get one of these. Uh, roll stats, 3d6, 2d6 hit points, uh, and then you pick a, or roll a background and a name. You obviously could do it differently, but this is how it would fit with the world. And so... Um, you're gonna you're gonna create a character. Now, what's interesting is that it says the other characters, the other backgrounds that aren't rolled, are NPCs. So you want to create them and generate them and have. If you're gonna run this, you'd maybe want to give each of these a name, and that way, when the when the players create them and name their character, then you have the rest as NPCs in the background. And essentially, uh, the, the the players are gonna have to navigate through a jungle, find these spirit animals until they can lead them to the ziggurat and they're going to be exploring, and there's going to be lots of dangers happening. I really like the use of, what would you call that, annotations on the side of each paragraph. It gives you a bit more information, <laughs> and like background, sometimes mechanical mindsets, or like thematic mindsets. I like that a lot. Uh, running the pyramid, the ziggurat, the thing that you actually get to, and how to, how to cleanse it, and how to go through it. Great map here. I like this. This is Dyson Logos, but it's great use of Dyson Logos map. And I love how it goes down. So you have the, um, well, it's Dyson Logos, so it's you know top tier. But you see how like the the side view shows you the spatial relation of the rooms vertically, as well. And you have the, the maps for the horizontal view. So I really like that. You get a sense of dungeons need to have verticality. They do really often don't. I think that's one of the things that's missing from a lot of dungeons. It's one of the reasons why I really like Art and Vol, which is what I'm uh, been going through slowly <laughs> in my um, just my own reading. I really love how vertical the dungeon is. That central shaft gives you a sense of that up and down movement instead of just horizontal movement. Um, so anyway, I really like this dungeon for that reason. There's a lot of good verticality. 
And then you get through to the uh, ending of the dungeon, which is the Golden Lion. Uh, you've got to fight this thing. I suppose you could try to cleanse it otherwise than fighting it, but that would be one way of doing it. And then the epilogue with some art at the end here, and then an appendices for treasure and random encounters. So that is Broken Circle. I really like this. I think it's a cool little, well, you could run it as a one-shot, or you could create a world around it, or you could just um, adapt it for your own game. But I like the public domain art. I like the idea, and uh, it's just, it's different. The use of the map is, is excellent. Uh, and this is, again, pay what you want on drive through, uh, or sorry, on itch.io, so I'll put the link. Last, I wanted to look at The Devil's Millhopper by Franco Alvarado. Alvarado. Uh, this is another game that was designed for Cairn and the Game Jam, a town of forest and a dungeon. And you get basically what you've come, what I've come to expect from that jam, which is a really good regional adventure. So there's a what's going on here. Essentially, you have this forest where there is a dryad, and the oldest dryad is something called the Mar. And then humans settled here, and they started... Um, yeah, it didn't work out so well, let's just say. <laughs> uh, three months ago, there is a company who has arrived here to mine for iron and phosphorus, and their chemicals are killing everything. So I think this uh, adventure was influenced, as the designer says later, by uh, Florida. Now, I've never been to Florida, so I don't know, but I think that's the idea here, sort of the Florida... Um, you know, not rainforest exactly. What do they call that? Uh, there's a word for it. I'm, I'm thinking of swamp, bayou. I don't know what it's called. There, the Everglades or something like that. I'm not sure exactly, but it's a particular um, tone in terms of the sort of forest you're dealing with. It's not just an ordinary, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> regular forest here. Uh, it seems more swampy and more sinkholy and more wet. And I think that's kind of the idea below. There's a mission, the Church of the Exalted, which tried to convert this area and it didn't work out. But they still have an influence here, and they still have um, relics that you can try to find, or perhaps a chest that's been lost. That, uh, it's a quest book. And then you have Lechua itself, a small settlement of 100 families. Now, one of the interesting things here is that there's an entrance to the dungeon right in town. Sort of. Essentially, the town has a, uh, has a well that goes down into a giant cave system, and that cave system connects to the, the big dungeon from another part of the forest. It does create a bit of a problem with the scale, but that's noted on the map, and it wouldn't be too hard to adapt. You get the random NPCs um, with their uh, names and professions and a secret they might have, uh, hazard tables, sub tables, and encounter tables, and I really like how, I've seen this elsewhere in Cairn, where the random encounter table is given in terms of each of the possible uh, disposition results as well, right? The, the, the mood results, and why, why it might be that. Right, so what would a helpful or friendly alligator mean? Well, maybe that means it's sleeping. If it's interested in kind, maybe it's playful. If it's neutral or curious, it's just basking. If it's wary, it may attack, it's lying in wait. And if it's hostile, it's actively hunting. Now, I'm not sure. I think sleeping alligators wouldn't necessarily be friendly or helpful, <laughs> right? I would say maybe they're leading to a, you know, who knows what, something else there. But, but you get the point. All of these are kind of interesting with their, um, with their each individual reaction. I like that, I think that's kind of cool. It gives you a sense of what this creature would be and, and why it is interested or kind or helpful or friendly when you might normally not expect it to be. Now, the maps are great, helpful. They're given in, in very just ambiguous terms. You don't get like particular distances on the map or how far or how long they take on the map itself. So you have to you know do your own work there and look through the adventure and read how far away things are and, and uh, figure it out that way. But it's not bad. And another thing is that the, um, the maps are, were originally um, flipped. And so I, I just edited it and moved them so that I could read them. But normally you kind of have to turn your head <laughs> just to read them. It's not a big deal. You get the trails and how long they are, what's going on down them. It's pretty cool. You know, you're looking at dealing with things that aren't well, it's Karen, so it doesn't seem to me that it's super, super combat-y or heavily fighting anyway. Combat is certainly a part of Karen, like most RPGs, but it's not like the central part of the game. So it's it's you know, a lot of stuff going on. Um, there's some interesting magic items here or there. You're dealing much more with like normal things, though, it seems to me, like cougars and raccoons 
And granted, there are dryads and a monster that's been created by those dryads. Um, and there's goons and a you know an evil mining company that's poisoning the land. But you're not dealing with it. Just seems to me like really, really, really crazy high fantasy. What you're dealing with is like normal world and this element of fantasy with the dryads, which I think is cool. It's an interesting tone. I I kind of like that a lot. And then you get the moss eaters who are kind of like mm, plant people. Lanky, spindly, limbed creatures with owl eyes and spaced out teeth that allow ticks to crawl out when they eat string moss. Yeah. Different faction you could deal with here. Ranger Tower, and uh, you can see it from all the different locations, and I think that's cool. What it can be seen from. It'd be nice, it'd be nice to note that in those other locations, but that's cool. And then there's the, uh, the uh, Poison Devil itself, which is this horrible creation kind of nasty. I like the image of the raccoon up in the tree above. That's so great. I love that raccoon. Now here's the dungeon. And uh, number eight is the Lachua Well, which is like right there with the dungeon. Like there's the mine, there's the Devil's Mill Hopper, but it's noted that these distances are not precise. It's not, these aren't 10 foot squares or 100 foot squares or anything. It's, it's just, it's up to you to figure out how far these things are one from the other. So a little bit of work again done on uh, work needed to be done on your end to figure out how these things connect in that way but i like that it's all connected and i like that there are different ways down into the dungeon that's cool that's really cool and then you have the horizontal view or sorry it's that side view of the devil's mill hopper itself which is rooms one through seven that's cool too so great dungeon just has that a, the caveat that you kind of have to do the distance yourself this is the, and it notes it here in the scale there's a dungeon procedure with the hazards there. Now, the map is reproduced every other page, which is interesting. It's good. I'm glad that it's there. It's, it's just funny that it's like, and the map again, and the map again, <laughs> and the map again. But it's not a big, I mean, it's, obviously it's actually helpful. It was just funny when I, when I went through. I thought there was like, is there a difference between these maps? But no, no, it's just the same map reproduced. But that's totally fine. Totally fine. You get the monsters and the NPCs here, given in the Cairn stat block. And then you get... The objects you can find here, weirding effects that, that can happen to you, uh, can permanently change your adventure. With background notes and acknowledgements, and a little bit of art there at the very end. Within the very maps, uh, the limestone pits and the moss woods. Again, give these to your players if you wanted. So that is the Devil's Mill Hopper. A great adventure for Karen. I like it a lot. I think it's a fantastic region. It's a cool theme, and I like the map. I think it's really well done. So uh, this was, these were eight adventures, The Devil's Millhopper, Broken Circle, both for Karen and both Pay What You Want on H.io. I'll put links below. There's The Dance of the Leprechaun, which is old school essentials, Pay What You Want on Drive-Thru RPG. Metery Mishap, which I think is $3 on Drive-Thru RPG. And I'll put a link below. That's for Shadow Dark. Barrow of the Raging Storm, Pay What You Want for Shadow Dark on Drive-Thru RPG. Downsize Dungeons, again, Pay What You Want for old school essentials on Drive-Thru RPG. And then The Keep Pamphlet, Pay What You Want, Drive-Thru RPG. Uh, for system neutral setting and hidden gods of the woods, which is pay what you want on itch.io for system neutral, uh, for a system setting of your choice. Hope they, hope these have been interesting, guys. I like them all, and, and obviously for different reasons. They're very different sorts of adventures you put in your game for different reasons, but I think they'd all be fun and they're all really cool. Uh, so I hope this has been an interesting video to y'all, and I will see you in another one.